Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. I am Trace, and this episode we are going to talk about the periodic table of elements. For the next three episodes, it's a shorter series than usual, we're going to talk about how the table came to be, who invented it, and how perfect it is. The crazy story of the guy who came up with the final table, and even how we're expanding the table even today, this day, now. Keep moving, you know. The table continues to get better and better. It's pretty incredible, actually, that the table works as well as it does, but don't worry, we'll get there. So make sure you come follow the show on Twitter. You can find us at TestTube. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. Make sure you subscribe here on YouTube so you get all three of the episodes in this series. And also, if you want to listen to the show, you can find it on iTunes. We have a podcast version that has all three of the episodes at once, so you don't have to wait if you don't want to. But first, what's up with the periodic table? Why do we even need one? The periodic table that we use today is a list of elements, but it's actually more than just a list of elements. It's not even really a table. It's actually a tool. It's like a mnemonic to understand how all the elements fit together and what they all can do. With the periodic table, scientists can, at a glance, predict chemical reactions. They can show how different elements relate to each other. They can talk about the properties of each element and relate them to other elements. And they're all grouped in different sections. And you know, I mean, there's a lot going on in just what is a simple table hanging on all of the chemistry classrooms in all of the world. But the invention of the periodic table itself, this wasn't just a simple thing. This took hundreds and hundreds of years and scientist after scientist trying to figure it out. It actually stretches all the way back more than 2,000 years to 330 BCE, when Aristotle looked at the elements of earth, air, fire, and water, and figured, we need to organize these somehow. It's getting, it's getting unwieldy. In the 1700s, a long time later, by then, Antoine Lavoisier wrote down what they knew of as 33 different elements. They classified them as metals and non-metals, but the thing is, in the 1700s, chemistry wasn't that awesome. So, most of these things weren't actually elements. They're like, oh, rock, that's an element. Not really. Lavoisier knew rocks were lots of elements. But the idea being they didn't know they could break them down further than they had. By the 1800s, 100 years later, chemists had figured out, oh, some of these break up into other pieces. There are 63 different elements, and their properties and compounds were added into this list. And now chemists started to notice that there were patterns among these 63 different elements. There were some physical properties that were similar. There were some chemical properties that were similar. Maybe we can start organizing these into a more easy-to-use list than just literally a list of elements. In 1817, Johann Dobereiner grouped elements with similar properties into groups of three, which he called triads. So Johann was grouping these elements into three triads, where the center element was some kind of related to the an average of the other two elements in the triad. He wasn't entirely right on that one. He was kind of wrong, but he was trying. Look, he was trying to say that there are relationships between the elements, and we should be able to organize them in this way, maybe, perhaps, which didn't turn out to be right necessarily, but he was trying. That's the important thing. Even in 1817, they knew they could do it. They were just trying to figure out how. In 1862, A.E. Beguier de Chancotois put a list of the elements in a spiral around a cylinder. So the elements were listed by increasing atomic weight, and he stacked closely related elements, noting that their properties were repeated every seven elements, and atomic weight, first of all, that is a huge problem. That's, that's wrong, but we'll come, we'll come back to it. This led Chancourtois to say that the properties of the elements are properties of numbers. That's a big deal. While A.E. Bagarre de Chancourtois was completely wrong about atomic weight, and it was real pretty to put it into a spiral on a cylinder, bro, but that's not going to work. However, he connected elements to numbers, and that's important. By using the chart, he was able to predict the stoichiometry of several metallic oxides. Stoichiometry is a great word. Stoichiometry, in case you don't want to look it up, sidebar, is the relationship between quantities of a substance which takes part in a reaction to form a compound. Basically, you can look at it as a ratio of different elements. It's pretty awesome. And then from that, he was all like, wait, you can predict that there are going to be elements in this repeating pattern. That's a huge advance, even though he was totally wrong. In 1863, John Newlands classified the 56 established elements 
into groups based on similar physical properties. So even though they figured there were more elements than 56, you can organize these 56 into this group. And he noted that similar elements existed by some multiples of eight in atomic weight. And he proposed the law of octaves and got made fun of by lots of scientists because it was a musical analogy in their I guess not that into those for some reason. By 1868, Lothar Meyer's table created a table that would have been really awesome. You know, Lothar Meyer has a pretty similar idea to what table we use today. But foreshadowing, we didn't use his table. It listed all the known elements. It demonstrated working patterns that we knew existed. And it listed elements by atomic weight. Still a problem. Stop going atomic weight, yo. There are like a bunch of different atomic weights of uranium, but uranium's still the element. So that doesn't work. You can't use atomic weight. You have to use something else. He gave it to a colleague for evaluation, and while the colleague was evaluating it, this Russian dude named Dmitry Mendeleev came out with a periodic table in 1869 that was boss. Before Meyer's colleague could get it back to him, Dmitry Mendeleev had already snatched it right out of there and he came in with the gold standard of periodic tables. This was in 1869. He was a Russian chemist dude with a crazy story who kind of looked like Santa Claus. I'm gonna talk a bit about him tomorrow, so make sure you come back for more Test 2 Plus and figure out why his table was so darn good. If you know anything about some of these other tables, why don't you tell us down in the comments. Come find us on Twitter if you like, and come back tomorrow for more Test 2 Plus.